We can turn again in our Bibles to Daniel chapter 2. <clears throat> and at this time, I want to draw your attention to verse 44 and verse 45. Here Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Well, this morning we are picking up the story from last week, and you will remember how uh, in the beginning of this chapter, we began this story with Nebuchadnezzar giving his wise men the impossible task of telling him his dream and his interpretation. And so children, you remember there was Nebuchadnezzar, he was lying on his bed that one night, and he had these frightening dreams, and he was anxious. And so he called his whole court together, and he said, men, you must tell me my dream and also the interpretation of it. And because they couldn't, Nebuchadnezzar began killing them. Well, when Daniel hears this news that the wise men are being taken and killed and his own life is on the line, Daniel, you remember, he goes to his friends and begins to pray. And there, following his prayer, God reveals the mystery of Nebuchadnezzar's dream to him. And this then led Daniel to praise the God of heaven. And following that, that song of praise, Daniel then rushes into the king's court. And this is where we find ourselves this morning. So here is Daniel, and he's in the king's court, and he's before Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar says to him, Are you able to make known to me the dream and its interpretation? And so, having heard that question, you can hear a pin drop. This moment of silence as, as Daniel stands there before the king and, and all the wise men's their lives are hanging in, in the balance upon this one Jewish exile. And then Daniel answers. And in this critical moment, when Daniel could have taken all the glory to himself, are you the man that's able to make known this dream? In that critical moment, Daniel points away from himself and he says, yes, I have the answer to your dream, but it's not me. It's not that I am any wiser than your other wise men, but king, know that there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. Well, that's what we saw last week. And today we are picking up with Daniel making known the dream and its interpretation. And our title for this morning sermon is The Clash of Kingdoms. Clash of Kingdoms. And first we'll see the alarming kingdoms of the world. Secondly, the authoritative king of heaven. And thirdly, the affected king of Babylon. So clash of kingdoms, and first of all, the alarming kingdoms of the world. Notice how Nebuchadnezzar's dream, it begins with this vision of a great image or statue. You see that in verse 31. Daniel says, you, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, this great image whose splendor was excellent. It stood before you, and its form was awesome. Now, literally, that last phrase, its form was awesome, could better be translated as its appearance was frightening. It, its, its appearance was awesome in the sense that it was causing fear. You were, you were standing before this image and you are awestruck. It's, it's this massive, colossal image of this man, this, this great man, and it's, and it's leaving you awestruck. You're trembling as you stand before this image. 
And so this dream that, that Nebuchadnezzar has of this image, it's, it's not like going to, to Queenston Heights, for example, where, where you look at that great statue of, of, of General Isaac Brock, and, and it, makes you, it makes you impressed. That's, that's not the case here. No, this, this statue is something far more frightening. It's, it's far more impressive, even than that impressive statue of General Brock. This statue is, is huge, it's, it's colossal, it's, it's filling the whole frame of, of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And as he's, he's standing and he's staring at this great image, he's, he's shaking in fear. It's awe-inspiring. It's enormous. Twice it says it's a great image. And so it's the type of sight, it's the type of image that, that when you come before it, it, it's so massive, it just leaves your heart thudding in your chest. It's alarming. And then Daniel gives us some future details that come in the dream that further describe this great and alarming image. Notice there's a head of gold. And then there's chest and arms of silver. There's a belly and thighs of bronze and then legs of iron and feet of iron and clay. And so just notice how the, the head of this man, is of this statue, is of gold. This precious, this costly material. And then from there, the, the materials, they, they go from, from precious down to powerful. So they move away from being less costly. It goes from gold to silver to bronze and to iron, and iron and clay. So it moves from, less, from costly to less costly, but from weak to powerful and strong. And so this is the alarming image of this giant man with these four distinct parts. This is what Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. This is one of the things that made him frightened. This, this awe-inspiring statue. But what does it mean? Well, that takes us away from the image to the interpretation. And God tells Daniel explicitly how to interpret this dream. Notice the end of verse 38. Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, you, you are this head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar, you are that great head of gold on this massive image And verse 39, but after you shall rise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. And so the interpretation is quite simple. This great and this frightening image of a man, it symbolizes the alarming kingdoms of the world. Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold, and and the rest of the parts of this one image are other kingdoms that are coming after you. And so this awesome, this awe-inspiring, glorious statue represents the frightening kingdoms of the world. While God tells us explicitly that Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold, and the rest of the details are left out. Who, Who is the, the, the chest and arms of silver, and, and f- so on. Well, we're not told the details here, but most commentators, and I agree with them, identify the chest and arms of silver as being that of the Medo and Persian Empire. And then the thighs of bronze are the Greeks, and the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay make up the Roman Empire as well. Uh, this seems to fit best with, with history as it unfolds, and also with future revelation that we will find in Daniel's own book. Uh, Daniel chapter 7, for example, being a parallel passage to this one. But that's not, even though we are examining these these other kingdoms and we're looking at the kingdoms of the world, the the point of this this dream and of this interpretation right now is for Nebuchadnezzar to see that that he is, yes, the head of gold on this great and awe-inspiring statute and that the rest of the statute is, are the kingdoms, the alarming kingdoms of the world. Well, what's the point? What is God communicating to Nebuchadnezzar? Remember, God is the one who has given Nebuchadnezzar this dream. Well, the image that Nebuchadnezzar sees, this is really history from man's perspective. This, what Nebuchadnezzar is seeing here, 
is how man, how we naturally look at the world. We naturally look at the world and we see, and and what we see is man filling the frame. We are impressed and and awestruck with with man. Man is is frightening. Man is unstoppable. Man is, is impressive. Man seems so significant. Man is, is very big in the minds of men. And this is true of us. Many of us, often we are, we are worshiping and fearing the men around us. This is what peer pressure is. What is peer pressure? But, but thinking that other people are, are very big. Man has, has grown in our eyes. And, and so because of how big they seem to us, we start to act in a certain way. Their, their bigness in our mind starts to dictate the way that we live. People are, are filling our, our minds. We are impressed and, and, and awestruck with, with other men. Or, or maybe you don't struggle with that so much. Maybe you don't struggle with, with worshiping others, but, but then you worship the man in the mirror. You yourself, like Nebuchadnezzar, you see yourself as, as the head of gold, and, and look at that, look at how awesome I am. And, and so everything becomes about me and what I can do. Well, this is the point in which God is saying, this is, he, he's, he's allowing us to see how man normally sees this world. We are, we are alarmed by the kingdoms of men. We look at China, we look at Russia, we look at America, and we are impressed. They look awesome. They look frightening, immovable. And so we tremble before them. Well, these are the alarming kingdoms of the world. But second now, in contrast, we want to see the authoritative king of heaven. Verse 44. And in the days of these kings... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. This is really the key to our text this this morning. And and like last week, notice how this text focuses on the God of heaven. The God of heaven. He, He is the king. He's the real king. He's the one who has authority. And so, yes, in this, in, in this dream, at first, at first, it seems like the awe-inspiring thing is man. Man is this colossal image, and that's what fills the frame. But as we move through this dream, we start to see that the real authoritative one, the real awe-inspiring one, is the God and the King of heaven. He has Authority. Authority is really one of the key words, uh, one of the key themes of this chapter as well. And it means, uh, just by definition, authority is the power to determine outcomes or the right to control and to command. It's, it's the ability to do what one wants. And authority really lies at the heart of kingship. A king is one who has authority. And so as we're reading through this story, who is the king here? Who's the one with authority? Well, it's Nebuchadnezzar. Everywhere we look, Nebuchadnezzar is the one who's acting. He's the one who, who makes the decisions. He declares the decrees. He's, he's the one who then issues the decree to start killing these wise men. He is the king. That's what his thoughts are. He has authority. He makes decisions. But what we need to see is that Nebuchadnezzar is nothing in comparison to the real king. Psalm 115, verse 3, is is one of my favorite verses, but our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. That's authority. That's absolute authority, absolute freedom to do according to his good pleasure. And that doesn't belong to Nebuchadnezzar. It doesn't belong to any of us, but it belongs to God. He is the authoritative king. And God's ultimate authority over other kings and kingdoms is displayed in our text in three ways. First, notice how God raises them up. God raises them up. Verse 37. You, O king, are a king of kings. Why? 
Why, why is Nebuchadnezzar a king of kings? That term meaning the greatest of kings. Why is he the king of kings? Answer, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And whenever, wherever the children of men dwell or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. And so God raises up kingdoms. He, he is the one who has given Nebuchadnezzar all the authority, all the power that he enjoys. And so Nebuchadnezzar, you are not the ultimate authority. God, God has given these things to you. He has delegated this authority to you. And the same truth is, is told to us in the New Testament, maybe most clearly in Romans 13. Romans 13 there you remember how it's, it calls us to honor and respect the authorities over us. And the reason for that is verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. And so this is, this is the truth about God. He is the authoritative king of heaven because he is the one who is over and above all other th- authorities. What this is telling us is that God is, is at the top of the food chain. He's at the top of the pyramid. He is the creator and he dishes out authority to whomever he pleases to do so. And so maybe you think you are a ferocious shark. And, and you are just eating up all of the little fish in your own dominion. You are exerting your own authority. You are the king in your world. You are doing whatever you please. What God is saying to Nebuchadnezzar, even the shark has to give authority to me, has to give accountability to me, because I am at the top of this food chain. And so it doesn't matter how great we are or how great we think we are, God is the authoritative king of heaven. And he's the one we must give an account to. And this is true for Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe in verse 37, when you heard Daniel call him a king of kings, maybe you, 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 your ears perked up and you thought, well, I, th- I thought that was a title only given to Christ. Well, the truth of the matter is that this title, king of kings, it was actually a title that was invented by these Babylonian and by the Persian kings. It was a title that, that Nebuchadnezzar gave to himself. He, he gave to himself this title. He looked at himself in the mirror and he said, I am a king of kings. I am the greatest king. I am the greatest. That's what Nebuchadnezzar was saying. And, and so Daniel is just bringing back this common title that Nebuchadnezzar had given to himself. And, but as he does so, Daniel makes clear that Nebuchadnezzar's authority comes from God. Nebuchadnezzar, realize, realize God has raised you up. God has given you all that you have. All that you have is a gift from God. Well, God's authority is displayed in raising kingdoms up, but it's also displayed in knocking kingdoms down. It's also displayed in knocking kingdoms them down. God determines when when it's time for a kingdom or civilization or a king or an individual to disappear. God, he determines all of these things. Our lives, our lives are determined by God. We cannot add a single second further onto our lives than what God has determined. And the same is true on the grand scale. The kings and the kingdoms, the prime ministers and the presidents, they are raised up by God and set down by God. And so Nebuchadnezzar, of course, he liked the way that this interpretation started. When Daniel said, you are the head of gold, no doubt Nebuchadnezzar's heart thrilled within him. Of course, of course that's me. There, this this great and, and, and glorious image. Yes, that's me. But then verse 39 came, and Daniel continued, But, but after you. And those are are some of the most humbling words that Nebuchadnezzar could hear. 
but after you. Nebuchadnezzar, yes, you are the great king right now. You are the greatest in your own mind. Your life revolves around you, and you are bringing everyone else in to serve you and your purposes. But know this, that there is a time coming that's after you. But after you. There's a time coming when you will be no more, when your power and your glory are gone. After you. After you. Have you considered the the truth of these words that that Daniel is bringing to Nebuchadnezzar? You who who maybe are so consumed with yourself, so consumed with, with the here and now in this life and what you can accomplish in this life for your own namesake, have you considered these words? But after you. There's a time coming. My friend, there's a time coming when you and your power and your glory that you have or you think you have will be gone. But after you, there's a time when your earthly life will be over, when your story will have, a, your earthly story will have a final period to it, the end, after you. Have you considered these words? As, as, as you think about setting your, your hopes in this world, as, as, you, as you invest all of your energies in storing up treasures on this earth, have you thought about, have you thought about this little phrase, after you? It's a, it's a mark of maturity. It's a mark of spiritual maturity to, to consider the end, to, to stand back, And to say, there is a time coming when I will die or when Jesus Christ will return again and bring me and I will have to give an account before his throne. That's a sign of maturity. That's a sign that the Spirit is beginning and is working in you. That when you begin to realize that my life is a vapor, that that there is an after me, that I am not going to last forever, that there is a marked date on the calendar when that is after my life. That's a sign of maturity. Have you started to be mature? Have you grown up in your thinking? Have you begun to consider after you? Are you ready? Are you ready for what comes after your earthly life? Are you ready to face what happens when you are dead and when you go to visit the king, the authoritative king of heaven? Well, this dream was given to Nebuchadnezzar at the beginning of his reign. We're told it's the second year of his reign. God is coming to this young, this powerful, this up-and-coming king, and he is giving him this dream and this vision, and he is saying, no that your end is coming. And so, young people, God comes to us in the early, early stages of life, and he approaches us, and he, he confronts us with the reality that there, is, that there is an end coming to us. Are you ready for that? Have you given thought? Have you prepared for that end? In Nebuchadnezzar's case, other kingdoms will take his place. After you, Other kingdoms will come up. But ultimately, ultimately, all the kingdoms of the world will fall. Yes, there is the head of gold, and after that comes a lesser kingdom of silver, and then of bronze, and then of iron. But ultimately, this one giant statue that represents the kingdoms of men, this giant statue will come crashing down to the ground. And that's verse 34, and it's shocking. Imagine the shock that Nebuchadnezzar got as he was dreaming this dream. And this ultimately is what strikes terror into his heart. This is what drives him to to seek out this interpretation. This is what is, is causing him to go mad with insanity as he's killing off his wise men. It's this, what he sees here in verse 34. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together 
and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. What a reversal. What a turning of the tide. Here, this great image, the kingdoms of men that instilled fear and alarm into the hearts of of many thousands of, of people and multitudes. This great image is struck down in an instant. And there is no trace of it left to be found. Do you see the picture? This giant statue is struck by the stone and it's ground down into dust and and the summer wind comes and it blows the dust away and you couldn't even tell that this image had been there at all. And notice how this happens. The stone comes that is cut without hands. And so this, obviously, is pointing us to a divine cause. It's cut without human hands. It's God's hand that's behind this stone. And that's the first thing we're seeing here. As as God tears down other kingdoms, he is the one who builds up his kingdom. He is the one who builds his kingdom, and he does so decisively. He does so through in a surprising way. He cuts out this stone and and the picture is is of a surprising thing that's happening here. This stone that was maybe so insignificant in comparison to this great statue, it's rolling and it's picking up steam and and it's moving towards this image and suddenly it collides and the image crashes to the ground. Here is God, and he's building his kingdom decisively, and he's doing it in a surprising way. And it's through his mediatorial king, Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is this stone. The stone that that God is using is his own son who comes in the flesh. Other passages of scripture, they speak of Christ as a stone. Uh, One, for example, is Psalm 118, verse 22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And all throughout Scripture, there are many places. Isaiah 28, verse 16, and in the New Testament, 1 Peter 2, and in Acts as well, Jesus is referred to as the stone, as the stone that's, that's at the heart and center of God's redemptive purposes. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the one who ultimately is building God's kingdom. Yes, God is decisively building his kingdom, but he's doing so through this agent, through this one person, through Jesus Christ, the mediator. And notice how we get a hint of that even here. Look at where the stone hits the statue. It hits the statue in its feet. And in that kingdom, the the legs and the feet symbolizing Rome, the stone comes at that time And it hits the kingdom in its feet. And this is when Christ came. He came in the fullness of time. He came when Rome was in its glory. When Rome was invincible, it seemed. When Rome was marching out with their legions. When Rome had on their throne a son of a god, as they called Caesar. When Rome had elevated themselves. That's when Jesus Christ, the stone, he came. And Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God. You find this in Mark chapter 1. He comes and he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's coming because I am here. I'm the king. The king has come. In Christ, he comes, yes, here in this dream, it looks like it's all one action, that the stone will come and these kingdoms will be crushed in an instant. But we know as scripture unfolds, and often prophecy does this, there are installments of fulfillment. Christ comes first, you might say, as a pebble. He comes in weakness. He comes, and it seems, he seems so insignificant. He comes as the man of sorrows. He comes suffering. He comes bearing reproach from others. He comes being hated. He comes being despised. He comes without a crown. No crown of gold on his head, but he takes up that crown of thorns. Yes, he comes as the suffering king, as the suffering Messiah, and his victory 
His victory is won in a most surprising way on that Roman cross. It's the Romans themselves who take him and nail him to that cross. And there in his shame, they're spitting upon him. They're mocking him. If you be the king of the Jews, then save yourself. That's how Jesus came. And that's how Jesus conquered. He came and he conquered in this way of apparent weakness. But there is strength Oh, infinite strength in his weakness as he is there drinking the cup of his father's wrath on account of these rebels, on account of rebels, those who have, who have lived their lives in opposition to this king of heaven. That's who Christ has come to represent. Those who, who have sinned against God and Christ is suffering for them. And so he wins this victory at the cross and through his res- resurrection, yes, he secures it there. But ultimately, he's coming back. And that's when we will find the full fulfillment of this dream here. When that stone rolls out of heaven, you might say. When Jesus comes with his angels surrounding him in glory. When he appears on a cloud in an instant. That's when glory, glory will be his. And he will have smashed the kingdoms of the world to the ground once and for all. Well, Jesus applies Psalm 118, which says he is the chief cornerstone, and Daniel 2, our text, to himself in Luke 20, verse 18. There he is. He's on the way to the cross. And he says, whoever falls on that stone will be broken. Whoever falls on that stone, they're referring to Psalm 118. God is laying a chief cornerstone in Zion. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken. Whoever trips over that stone in unbelief, if that stone is a stumbling block to you like it was to so many of Christ's own human race, of of his own nationality, of the Jewish people, if if you trip over him in unbelief, then you will be broken. You will be decimated by this king. But also he goes on. But on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. And there it seems he's making an allusion to our text. Whomever this stone falls, that when this stone comes and it falls on you in your kingdom that you are setting up, if you are continuing in rebellion against him at that time, then you will be ground to powder. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? This is coming from the lips of the compassionate, of the gracious Savior, of the one who's the man of sorrows. He is speaking to you early so that you might turn to him. Just like God came to Nebuchadnezzar here early and is giving him this vision, Christ comes to us early on and he's warning us and he's saying, if you trip over me in unbelief or if you continue on in rebellion, just ignoring me, then you will be crushed. God, God is building his kingdom as he tears down the kingdoms of this world. And the question then for us is where do we stand? Where do we stand in relationship to this stone? Where do we stand in relationship to this Christ? Are you on a collision course with the king of the universe? Oh, my friend, What can I do to convince you otherwise? You will be ground to powder. You will be destroyed by this almighty king. And he is here this morning and he is coming and he's saying, I am a gracious king. I am a king who's building my kingdom so that it fills the earth. So that it fills the earth like a mountain. That's what I'm doing still today. I am gathering in people from tribes, from nations, from different groups, even here. From our location, he is gathering people to to make up the kingdom of God. And so that's that's what God wants us to, to heed this day, this gracious invitation to become a part of Christ's kingdom. Well, the stone cut without hands, it represents the eternal, the universal rule of God through Christ, his mediatorial king. It represents the eternal universal rule of God through Christ, his mediatorial king. And and there's two things then we need to see that's different about Christ's kingdom. First of all, it's duration. It's eternal. Christ's kingdom is eternal. 
Verse 44, God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people and it shall stand forever. Every other kingdom, just like this image, the head of gold, it will be replaced by silver. And the silver is replaced by bronze. And the bronze is replaced by iron. And the whole king statute then is crushed by this kingdom of heaven. But unlike these worldly kingdoms, unlike our own kingdom, if we are living for ourselves, Christ's kingdom, here's a kingdom that's eternal, that spans forever. And that's what you are being invited to. Not to defeat, not to ruin, but to come and to enter into this kingdom that lasts forever, where glory goes on forever, where the king is reigning eternally. It shall stand forever. And then notice, secondly, the scope. Its duration is eternal, but its scope is universal. Verse 44, it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it will grow like a great mountain, filling the earth. And so what, what God is saying is that Christ shall have dominion from sea to sea. Christ's glory will fill this whole globe in due time. And so here's, Neb- here's Daniel speaking to, ba- to Nebuchadnezzar, his king. Here's Daniel the slave, Daniel the exile, Daniel the one who's, who is about to be killed, and he is speaking to this, this great and awesome king, Nebuchadnezzar, and he is saying, I'm a citizen of this kingdom. I am a citizen of the kingdom of God, a kingdom that lasts eternally, a kingdom that has scope, is universal scope over all of the world. I am a a part of this kingdom, and I'm speaking to you about my king. The stone is my king, and that's true for all of us, for all of us who know Christ through faith and repentance. And so hear the victory that's just screaming to us off of these pages. You who maybe this past week ha- has been full of defeats. You, it's just been defeat after defeat. Maybe there's been frightening news come your way or it's you've been feeling your weakness and you can't carry on. Then hear the victory. Hear the triumph in Daniel's voice. This is the triumph we can have as exiles in this world. Our king, he is conquering. He has an eternal kingdom. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and it will span from sea to sea. This is our victory right here. So God's authority, the king of heaven's authority is displayed in raising up these other kingdoms and tearing them down but also in telling them beforehand. That's what we see here. He's telling them. God is telling them beforehand what is going to happen. God is declaring to Nebuchadnezzar the end from the beginning. Here's Nebuchadnezzar in the second year of his reign. He is in the, in the peak, of, in, in his prime, and all things are going well. And God is giving him a forecast that's not like our weather forecasts that are hit and miss. But, but God's forecast is, is final. It's sure. That's, that's how Daniel ends this, this, this dream and interpretation. He says these things are sure. They are sure. They are certain. It's God speaking. He knows the end from the beginning. And he's telling them all beforehand. And so just notice. Notice the focus of God's revelation. Isn't this surprising? Here is Nebuchadnezzar, and he is getting a forecast of world history. God is telling him the story of the world. Here's the story of the world summarized in a few verses. What would you have said? How would you have summarized that? What what details would you have gone in? Where is America mentioned in this story? Where is the great kingdoms? Where is Great Britain? Where is the kingdoms of the past? Where are the Mongols? Where, Where are all of these kingdoms? The focus. Notice God's focus. Yes, man's kingdoms will rise. They will be alarming. But this stone, this stone will come and it will crush, it will crush the kingdoms of men and it will become this great mountain and it will fill the earth. God's focus is on Christ and on his coming kingdom. 
This is what matters in history. This is the significant thing. If anything significant has happened in this world, it happened 2,000 years ago when Christ was born, when he died, when he rose again, when he ascended into heaven. And as in the years that's intervened since then, as he's building his kingdom, these are the significant facts. Christ, God is saying, Christ was not an afterthought. He was not an afterthought. His redemptive plan was there from the start. This stone was always rolling. It was always coming. It had to be. Because here, God had his purpose and his plan of redemption and grace and mercy and salvation for his people. And so, what encouragement for you and I who, who, who love this king. Just think about it. Here, God is hundreds of years in advance, declaring through Daniel what is going to happen. And then we go to the New Testament and we find it fulfilled in Christ. And just think, all of the millions of details, that, that all of the little choices that had to be made throughout those couple hundred years to get Jesus to be born in, in, in Bethlehem. And all the little facts that had to work its way out so that Jesus could live his perfect life and that Jesus could be uh, despised by his people and crucified by the Romans. All of these millions and millions of facts encompassing all of these, these sins of God's people even and all of these things, these human choices coming together and yet in the midst of it all and through it all, God is, a, is accomplishing his purposes. And so cannot God orchestrate your life? Yes, it looks messy. Yes, it looks uncertain. But can't he be in control of your life, orchestrating the end from the beginning, just as he did here in bringing Christ? God's word is faithful. It is sure. He has promised us all things work together for good, for those that love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. And it is sure. It is certain. Well, that is the authoritative king of heaven. But finally then, the affected king of Babylon. Notice that this dream is given to warn this unbelieving Nebuchadnezzar. This is gracious revelation that is being given to this unbelieving pagan king. And notice how it affects King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 46 Nebuchadnezzar falls down on his face. That, there's, there's activity. Verse 47, the king answered Daniel and said, Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. There is confession. And so do you see the king of Babylon, he's clearly affected by, by this dream and by its interpretation. There's impact. It's making impact on him. There's force behind these words. He's feeling it. And if you were Daniel and you were witnessing to this king, wouldn't you get excited? Wouldn't you get excited as as he falls on his face before you and declares that your God, your God, is truly God of gods. He's the greatest gods. He's the supreme God. Wouldn't you get excited if this happened, if you shared the gospel? This, here in Nebuchadnezzar, it's as if he's walking the aisle. He's, he's praying the prayer. He's ke- making this confession, giving great testimony. This is the celebrity convert we've been waiting for. Nebuchadnezzar falling on his face. What a promising confession. Truly, your God is the God of gods. What a promising confession. But don't be fooled. There's no conversion here. There's no conversion here. Chapter 3 begins with Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold. And so do you see how frightening man's heart is? It's deceitfully wicked. He receives this gracious revelation from God about this image and about its coming doom and Nebuchadnezzar twists that gracious gracious revelation and he says, I don't only want to be the head of gold, I'm making a grand statute of myself completely of gold. And so there are lessons here. Conviction isn't conversion. Conviction isn't conversion. There obviously was conviction here or else Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't be falling on his face. 
he wouldn't be falling on his face, declaring God to be the true God. Conviction isn't conversion. Millions of people are convicted, but never converted. The demons, when Jesus Christ came through this world, the demons trembled. They were, they were shaking, and yet they weren't converted. Conviction, conviction is common to most men, but conversion is not. Conviction isn't conversion. Convi- confession, confession isn't conversion. Yes, confession is an essential part of the Christian life. And confession, to be a Christian, means we are confessing Christ on some level. But that's not nearly enough. Notice that uh, Nebuchadnezzar gives this great confession, but there's no conversion. And so God is not just seeking our lips, but he's seeking our lives. That's the necessary thing. Not just, just our, our words, but, but, our, but our works, our, our life being changed, conversion. That's what it means to to change this this turning. And conversion is marked by faith and repentance. Yes, initially, but also lasting and abiding faith and repentance. Faith and repentance. This becomes the way of the Christian. And conversion, of course, isn't perfection. It's not that there's no sin in the believer's life. It's not that there's nothing that that needs to be repented of. No, it's the opposite. The Christian sees that there is sin in his life and he needs to turn from it and he does turn from it by the Spirit's help. He confesses it. He hates his sin. He, he confesses it with, and with conviction he turns from it. But there's also faith apprehending the mercy of God, reaching out to God in mercy, grabbing hold of Christ and what he's done. There's faith and repentance. Is this present in your life? Or is there just confession? Are you like Nebuchadnezzar? Just conviction, just confession, but no conversion. Friends, this is what we need. We need the Spirit of God to work this in us, this faith, this repentance, and in this ongoing way. That's where God is is seeking to drive us through his gracious revelation. Well, the story ends with Daniel and his three friends being promoted. And here they are. They began the story with their life being threatened. And now here they are elevated to the highest seats in Babylon. And so don't you see how God works mysteriously in his providence? This thing that threatened Daniel's life, this thing that shook him to the very core, this thing that got him and his friends together for a prayer meeting all night that they would pray before God. Their life was on the line. This thing that looked terrifying to them, that they couldn't understand, God uses it for their good. He uses this event to raise them to the highest places in Babylon. Now, of course, God doesn't always rescue us in this life, but we know that in the life that comes, it is to live, yes, is Christ, but to die is gain. And so we can trust our Father. We can trust ourselves to our good Heavenly Father that he is in control even when the worst of providences seem to come knocking on our door. And so then as we close, let's close with the title, Clash of Kingdoms. Clash of kingdoms. That's what's happening in our world. That's what's happening in your life. What side are you on? What what kingdom are you in? What kingdom are you standing? What represents you? Are you a part of this great statue of man? Or are you part of this stone that becomes the mountain? As Jesus says, are you with me or are you against me? Amen. Let us...